The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining this Remy webinar, Resilience and Supply Chain Transportation Networks, that is being hosted by Igor Linkov, Senior Science and Technology Manager with the U.S. Army Engineer Research and Development Center. Igor creates methods and tools that are used to measure resilience in regard to the supply chain and crisis management. He's been very busy working on the response and recovery following the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm Brian Real, Marketing and Event Coordinator at Remy, and I'll be hosting this webinar. At all times during this presentation, you can ask questions in the question box. And at the end, if there's enough time, I'll moderate these questions for Igor. So if we run out of time, I'll give all the unanswered questions to Igor so he can hopefully reach out to you personally. Thank you again for attending everybody and uh, take it away, Igor. Uh, thank you very much. It's an honor to be invited to do this webinar. Uh, I have been working with Remy over two decades now, and I was always impressed uh, at the depths and capabilities that they bring. And we've done uh, some joint research that I'm going to present um, in a moment as a part of my overall presentation. So first, um, uh, I am part of a uh, research arm of Army Corps of Engineers. It's Army engineer research and development center uh, we are federal government but what is unique about us we are project funded so in that capacity we can execute work for uh, any agencies in federal government um, as long as they can provide funding for us so in a sense we operate as a think tank uh, within government um, and transportation work is actually one example uh, where we started uh, with military side and then moved to transportation methodologically. So um, we are going to talk today about supply chain and transportation. Uh, I just clip uh, a couple of uh, articles from a recent publication. I don't think I need to uh, convince uh, anybody that supply chain is important, and especially in transportation networks. Um, the problem with supply chain is that most of the work, uh, including transportation supply chain, was done on optimization, right? They like to have just enough trucks and ships uh, and people uh, to execute a life cycle of product from you know, production to delivery to consumers and um, waste uh, disposal. Right. Unfortunately, uh, that's not how it works. Uh, the system, uh, the systems that are part of supply chain are interconnected and uh, it makes uh, this optimization uh, really uh, susceptible uh, of the system to cascading failures. And this is what we see now, uh, that the optimization for efficiency uh, result in a system that may uh, be so fragile that if disruption happen, they cannot really recover and they decline. So uh, what we are doing, and this is kind of summary and uh, example of transportation work that we do for California, we, we like to connect uh, supply chain of products from production uh, to transportation by ship and ports and freight uh, to consumers, and obviously we're dealing with very different data sets, uh, and we like to have uh, what is called data fabric that connects everything uh, that includes data management, um, uh, risk and decision analytics, supply chain modeling, and of course, so this is what Remy does, economic models. So uh, this is kind of cartoon of uh, the project that we do for California Transportation Commission that would be consumer of the whole products, but we are not there yet. So I like to highlight a couple of fundamental issues that are relevant to building this uh, solution. Uh, and I like to start with uh, a differentiation of risk and resilience. There is a lot, a great deal of confusion about uh, risk and resilience uh, in general and specifically in supply chain context. Um, and um, most of the federal regula and state regulation are focused on dealing with risk, which is a uh, situation involving exposure to threat. So obviously risk is uh, characterized as the product of threat, uh, which is coming outside of the system, vulnerability that is part of the system, 
uh, and consequences a result of threat acting uh, through exposure to vulnerabilities and resulting in detrimental impact. If you deal with threat uh, or uh, exposure or consequences, you can achieve a state of security, right? Uh, to do that, you harden the system so it's not vulnerable. Um, resilience actually starts in the very different point. Resilience acknowledge that uh, system can fail. So threat uh, may be too severe and vulnerability may be too high and we're going to fail. Uh, but uh, resilience assumes that if you can recover fast, it may be okay, right? So risk and resilience are complementary, uh, but uh, it has very little overlap uh, because risk starts, uh, uh, resilience starts where risk ends, right? And this curve, it really shows that uh, all we do in risk analysis, we try to keep system functional. Uh, on y-axis, you have functionality. And the goal of risk assessment and management is to find a way to design systems so it doesn't fail. It keeps going in a robust way. Uh, with resilience, and this is where we are now with many supply chain, we find ourselves that we fail in risk management and our functionality is affected. And now we have a problem because uh, we can fail and die basically, or we can recover. And the science of recovery is not as developed the science of risk. And um, that's focus of our research is looking at how to make system recoverables uh, and what are the economic impact of having system that are not recoverable. That's an example that I will show with uh, Remy's support. So the key in all this is ability to measure resilience, right? Uh, because if you cannot measure, you cannot really find what is the impact of lack of resilience and you cannot find a way to improve resilience. So uh, in the most general sense, you can measure resilience through metrics-based approaches or model-based approaches. And metrics-based approaches is actually what we see now left and right. People use different metrics, uh, individual metrics about system performance. How many people are in the school? How many cars are on the road? What is the temperature? You know, those temperature numbers are all metrics. We can combine them in indices, right? You know, indices may include very heterogeneous metrics, right? If you combine stocks of Dow chemicals and you know, uh, uh, Caterpillar, it's very different companies, and but you get an index that you know, we all use in tracking financial market. Um, we can visualize this uh, indices and metrics in the dashboard. Um, what we do uh, in the resilience, we use decision analytics. It's still metrics-based approaches, but it allows adding uh, mission space, uh, weighing importance of individual metrics for overall measure of resilience, right? Uh, obviously, um, as with anything, you know, we like to have models uh, and models can be process-based or statistical. Uh, you can do agent-based models. Um, what we are working on, we are going to show is kind of combination of network and statistical models. Um, and uh, I think that will be a focus of uh, my presentation. But before I go uh, towards model-based approaches, I like to tell a few words about metrics. So the idea is that you need to still with metrics-based approaches, you need to represent the system and system includes physical, cyber, cognitive and social domains. And what we do with uh, metrics-based approaches, we try to ensure that all of these domains are captured as, as well as phases of re risk resilience. So the system should plan and prepare and absorb. And in most general sense, plan and prepare and absorb a part of risk assessment and management. And then we are adding recovery and adaptation. This is actually how uh, true resilience is defined. And uh, as a result, you get this uh, matrix of uh, four by four cells. And if you have metrics uh, in each of the cell, and if you have weight associated with each cell, and weight may be representative of importance 
of this cell to your specific mission, then you can get um, resilience measured in utility scale, right? It doesn't have any units like, you know, dollars or probabilities, but rather unitless representation of metrics uh, that characterize state of the system and value that you or somebody else as a decision maker assigned to this matrix or stages of resilience or uh, subcomponent of the system. And then it allows you to compare uh, different intervention. For example, I reduce cost of something in cognitive domain. I, I bought a decision support system or I built something to make system recoverable, right? Uh, and it may increase resilience uh, by a lot or by a little uh, and obviously each one of those has associated cost, and this provide framework for making decision, right? Um, but obviously, um, uh, this metrics-based approaches are deficient because we do not know how all these are interconnected and what are the processes operate. So in network-based resilience uh, models, what we do, uh, we try to represent resilience as uh, a function of properties of nodes, uh, that represent the system component links, that represent connections, topology of the network, and you know other factors. And with that, um, we can look at a transportation network as well as other networks. Right? So, uh, next series of slide will deal with efficiency and resilience in road transportation network. Right. So. Um, in general, um, we can represent roads uh, as a network. So you have stretches of the road connected to intersection to another road. And in different cities, you have maps of this network. You can translate, uh, you can digitize them, and you can develop network structure and topologies of these networks. And uh, what we've done that and what we are looking is efficiency uh, of this network, which means ability of the network to move traffic uh, from point A to point B fast. So if you have a lot of traffic, uh, uh, it's slow, uh, the, the transportation network is not efficient. Uh, resilience is actually a different thing. If you have major accident, if you have weather event, resilience um, is measured as additional time uh, that uh, we need to kind of get back to normal, right? And normal may be a lot of traffic, uh, but it's additional time that this accident generates. Um, so um, I think that's a very important distinction between because um, not much is done on uh, highlighting the difference. And this is our paper that was published in 2017 on these issues that you know get like a lot of citations and attracted significant interest in media I was interviewed by multiple news outlets uh, but the model that we create is, is in a sense very simple we look at 40 cities we kind of uh, usually each city has like one of these round roads around them so we try to uh, really say well within different cities we have uh, this uh, border of the network and we we develop a model that uh, calculates time that you need to get uh, the, the time that that uh, measures ability to go from a suburban suburban area to the center of the city uh, and we use simple gravity model that kind of translate um, flows of cars from dense area to less dense area the model was calibrated with just a few parameters and you can see that it performs relatively well. And then we generate disruptions. We generate natural disasters, like more targeted disruptions or random, uh, or we can use attacks, disabling traffic control and so forth. And uh, obviously when you start to disrupt links or kill nodes, uh, with, with, you know, here you have percentage if you kind of disrupt one percent of roads or two percent or whatever three four you can see uh, additional delays that system generate in multiple cities right 
Um, so what we've done, uh, we compare these delays, which we call a resilience, uh, uh, because that's extra time that uh, we need uh, to, to move after disruption, with efficiency, what we kind of observe in the system at normal operation without disruption. And you can see that um, some cities are not resilient and not efficient, like San Francisco, Houston, Washington was in that category, but you know, I'm not actually now in Washington, it's empty, it's a ghost town. So now Washington probably will be moved uh, to this corner, uh, just because you have huge reduction on the number of cars uh, that are moving here, because government is not fully operational in the office space. But anyway, I, I like to show you San Francisco and LA. Both of them are inefficient, a lot of traffic, but LA is very resilient, which means that if you generate uh, accidents in LA, um, they dissipate very quickly. There's not enough, not much of extra time uh, that slows you down. But in San Francisco, if you're stuck, you know, it takes a long time to get out of a bridge or stretch of a highway. And, you know, you may have cities that are efficient, but not resilient. You know, Florida uh, comes in mind because in Florida you have a couple of big highways. And uh, if one of them are uh, uh, impacted, it's very difficult to get around. You have, you just have to stay on it, right? Same in Providence, Rhode Island, where I live. Uh, you know, we have a couple of highways and it's very difficult to get around traffic jams if you have them in the main highway. So um, what we've done then, we took this model and we tried to connect with Remy uh, transite model, right? You know, uh, we generate random network disruption that uh, result in delay. And uh, we try to use transite to figure out economic impact of lack of resilience. So uh, what we're finding is that it's really interesting because um, the way economists usually look at delays, it's all linear, but we find like really high nonlinearity. So um, efficiency related delays uh, result in a relatively small, well, not relatively small, but in some changes in regional GDP. While resilience related delays uh, generate uh, much more uh, impact. GDP is more severely affected. Uh, you can see here it's like less than 1% uh, and this logarithmic scale. And here it maybe go up to 10%. So it's a huge difference. Why is that? Uh, and this is another way to visualize, right? Without uh, delay, you can see this. Without uh, integration of resilience, you can see the scalar bars, but with resilience, you see much more in logarithmic scale. Why is that? It's intuitively, it's easy to understand because uh, you can plan for lack of efficiency, right? You know, if I know that I can be in the office anywhere uh, between like half an hour and hour, 15 minutes, I will not schedule any important meetings uh, in like uh, hour and a half uh, from my departure from home. But if I uh, schedule important meetings and I stuck in accident or whatever, uh, the cost of missing that meeting is much higher, uh, right? So uh, this is obviously a gross simplification, but I think that's kind of what we see here. Um, and uh, with Remy models, we can model temporal patterns, like, you know, you have bad winter and now it recovers next year. It's probably very close to where it was before. Some cities are better than others, but I mean, uh, it's not a big deal. Or uh, you can look at economic impact. We uh, start working with uh, airports and you can see impact uh, of uh, lack of resilience in the airport traffic, right? You can see impact statewide. So um, next set of slides is about freight model that we developed for California. And this is, um, we, we don't have economic component there yet. Um, we might soon, but what is interesting here that we connect artificial intelligence and optimization to find multi, to solve multiple problems that state of California has. 
Uh, and as I said, it's kind of creative way to uh, connect AI with uh, resilience analytics and network science. So uh, what we basically done, you know, similar to what you saw before, we look at uh, road infrastructure in California and we try to, this is all data driven approaches, we try to solve specific problem like, you know, how um, cargo moves from ports to warehouses and to consumers. So you can see kind of um, destination of uh, cargo traffic. Um, we were able, uh, second, I don't see my slides. So we were able to look at uh, resilience and supply chain, impact of natural disaster. Uh, a lot of work that we do, it's uh, building uh, green infrastructure in California, including uh, uh, placing uh, hydrogen refueling station and electric refuel charging station. And finally, we work on integration of uh, equity in uh, infrastructure development. Um, so, one second. Uh, so this is kind of map that we generate related to natural disaster uh, coming from wildfires, uh, sea level rise, earthquake, and things like that. Uh, I just kind of show snapshot because I don't think we have time to go in any details. Um, this slide shows um, location of hydrogen refueling stations. So we were able, using AI and optimization tools, we were able to reconstruct how trucks move within California, including different types of trucks. And from that, when you know how trucks move, which road they take, we can find optimal location for a hydrogen infrastructure that state of California is building. Um, and then I like to show a couple of other cool projects that we have on supply chain, maybe not related to transportation. So um, this project is, uh, we look at uh, uh, 5,000 uh, projects that Army Corps does, uh, and we see that many of them delayed. Uh, now, like uh, last, in 2021, 80% of projects were delayed, which is unprecedented. Even during Afghan war, when we were stretched thin, we had only like 30, 40% of project delay. Uh, I think in 2022, like everything is delayed. Um, uh, and then the question is like, why and obviously it's supply chain impact um, and we're now analyzing supply chain impact but this shows uh, impact of uh, foreign sourced minerals like nickel we see that most of our project have little dependency on nickel but some of them are very high dependency uh, and this is like more broader uh, project that we have for navy we look at uh, percentage of foreign content in equipment that they need for military construction. And you can see up to 30% are coming from abroad and, you know, most of it is electronics. So this is really worrisome uh, for Congress and for Navy. Uh, and I think that would be true for many other construction projects. Uh, actually, I'm now at the meeting with uh, DARPA. Uh, we are leading uh, a government evaluation for the, the program on supply and demand networks. Uh, in this program, we look at mapping net acquisition networks and mapping both risk and resilience and doing stress testing. And stress testing methodology we developed for United Nations allows to look at uh, ability of the system to recover from disruptions and uh, it's kind of generalization of what I just present for transportation um, at kind of more economic scales. So this is work in progress. So uh, let me summarize um, the vision that we're trying to convey that we represent a real world uh, through a model that includes interconnected cyber, physical, social network. And we like to identify uh, points in this network that needs to be enhanced for both minimizing risk and enhancing increasing resilience of the system. And yeah, we published a lot, uh, probably hundred or so papers on uh, this and um, multiple books. So with that, I will be glad to answer questions. 
All right, thank you everybody. Uh, thank you, Igor, for the great presentation. Uh, a copy of this recording, uh, or copy of the recording and the slides from this webinar will be available shortly on our website. Um, and I'll send an email out to the, all those who registered with that link. Um, let me quickly check. Uh, it actually looks like there aren't any questions yet. I can give a second to wait if, if anybody has, is typing one. Uh, Obviously, uh, I'm open for a uh, conversation on this topic. Feel free to contact me. I guess my email is easier to find. Yep, and also if you email info at remy.com, I'll make sure to forward any questions about this webinar along to Igor so we can get back to you. Um, All right. Well, it looks like it looks like we're good. Again, thank you, Igor, for the great presentation. Very insightful and very engaging. And uh, again, if you have any questions, reach out to info at remy.com. We'll gladly direct you to Igor, or if it's a Remy question, we'll gladly help you in any way we can. And uh, I hope everybody has a great day. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Oh wait. Wait, we did get a question. Yeah, Igor, if you're interested, we can. Uh, so the question yeah. is: Many transportation networks take the form of non-random shocks. For example, serial links on a network being disabled simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Have you attempted to uh, simulate this type of disruption? Yeah, we're actually doing that right now. Um, we uh, have a large project when we connect flood-related risk, which you know obviously going to happen in some areas. Uh, with random disruption and other disruptions. So uh, this is what is, we call compounding uh, threats, when you have multiple threats uh, acting at the same time. Uh, but yeah, uh, obviously uh, scenarios of removing specific roads uh, due to flood or earthquake or breaking uh, roads. Uh, you know, in our work in California, for example, we saw the two major highway uh, getting close to each other in a wildfire area, obviously, you know, if wildfire happened there, you know, California will not be able to connect uh, south and north, which is not good. So yeah, we do this type of work. Yeah. Excellent. Um, we have another question. Could you please elaborate more on the equity analysis of the California's freight transportation network? Yeah, so it's a very interesting question. Um, uh, Communities are different, so some uh, communities may like to have refueling station there, but it means that you have trucks uh, coming there and pollution and all that. So um, what we do uh, there, we try to stimulate economic development of disadvantaged communities, but integrate their values and visions about building this uh, freight infrastructure, right? So we need to be sensitive. So we cannot uh, put a, a refueling station in the community that don't want to have it, right? So we kind of uh, try to understand uh, what drives these communities, what their system of values, and then integrate that in what we do. Um, we are building this ideas from work that we did during the COVID. If you remember, in the early day of COVID, vaccines were uh, difficult to get and many disadvantaged communities had no access. So we developed this geospatial optimization approach when we tried to identify these islands, uh, vaccination islands as we call them, where uh, people uh, either had uh, inability to uh, access vaccine because you know they were remote uh, or maybe for the lack of education or for other factors. So we were able to work with uh, uh, states and governors offices to develop intervention that would uh, specifically target such communities and they they proven to be very efficient. So. Great. Um, the next one, I believe, is asking, how do you measure disruptions effect on GDP? Uh, so uh, that's actually Remy know-how. 
uh, my understanding is that uh, they have this trans site model uh, where you can enter delay, uh, uh, you know, like you change the time that requires uh, for commute to the offices, right? And the delay uh, get propagates through the model uh, that result in uh, reduced uh, output of uh, whatever sector that result in this delay. And then it's kind of cascades through other sectors and eventually they were able to calculate overall impact on GDP. But I don't know if anybody from Remy is online, maybe they can uh, talk more about that. Uh, personally, I, I, I would I could direct whoever asked the question to one of our analysts that is much more yeah. in depth with the model and the equations and the methodology behind it. And I'll gladly reach out with some more details about that. Uh, do we have another yeah, question? Resilience model, uh, uh, what resilience model generates is extra time uh, that uh, takes for transportation in this case. Though, again, if we go to other application, it may generate all kinds of other factors, but that's what we did. That's just illustrative case. We published it, so uh, we'll be glad to share paper. Probably it has more uh, in-depth methodological discussions. Over. Great. Uh, the next question is, um, how can we consider the importance of a labor and supply chain considering a disaster like COVID? That's a very good question. I, I didn't show this slide, but um, uh, remember slide when we look at 5,000 projects that Army Corps has, um, what we analyzed there as well is uh, labor availability. And what is interesting is that in 2017, uh, we have twice as many contractors as we have now. So it means that the number of companies we can work with only half of what it used to be, but you may know that through Infrastructure Act, we have to build like three times more. Our budget for this year for construction budget is increased by a factor of two. Uh, so uh, we need to do more of these fewer vehicles to access people. So it's very detrimental impact. But again, in our model for supply chain, we have this social domain, which includes structuring of uh, human resources, command and control, availability of contractors as a separate network that can be modeled. So I think that's how we approach it. Over. Great. And that looks like they were the final questions. Again, if you do have any other questions, you can feel free to reach out to us and we'll make sure that the message gets along to Igor uh, so he can, yeah. he can answer. Um, any again, any Remy related questions, we will be more than welcome to direct you to some resources. Um, oh, here we go. One more. What are some examples of strategies for reducing cyber risk and improving resiliency of supply chain network? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, cyber is uh, cyber physical system is what uh, we are working on now in military context, especially and military installations. Um, the problem with cyber is that uh, from threat point of view, it's very easy for adversaries to see uh, new targets. So if, if I have a target and I see that it's hardened, I will not attack that, I will do something else. It's very different than natural disasters, right? With natural disasters, you know where flood is coming, you can build seawall. With cyber, yeah, you can build equivalent of seawall, but then they will find another vulnerability. So it will, uh, it will not reduce risk in any appreciable way, right? So, um, and cyber attack on supply chains, again, to be not more numerous. Um, so, I mean, uh, mathematically, we can integrate them the same way as anything else. Um, but uh, the methodology for finding uh, alternatives for recovery, how to build supply chain that are recoverable, uh, I think that's really interesting question that is not fully addressed mathematically. We are talking about resilience by design when we have kind of self-healing networks uh, that you know one node 
can uh, take responsibilities of other nodes that been killed, for example, or uh, kind of other issues like that, or uh, resilience by intervention when uh, you are not necessarily uh, building uh, resilience in the network, but rather you have stockpile of resources outside of the system that available while you're fixing the system. So I think that's how we're thinking about that and we start implementing some of these ideas in different projects. Over. Great, thank you. And um, seems to have uh, been the last question and uh, Thank you everybody for attending. Thank you, Igor, again for the great presentation. Yeah. I, I feel better that I get at least a few questions. So thank you for asking. I really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, very, okay. very few questions. And uh okay. yeah, thank you for attending and have a great day, everybody. Bye.